Good evening, everyone. Um, you're very welcome this evening. I hope you're all doing well. Thank you, as always, for joining me. I'm going to get straight into things this evening um, because this is a big topic. And one I know you'll be interested in, and that's Circo. Uh, we're all aware of what's going on. Well, there's a lot of things going on. But while we're increasingly locked in our houses, uh, and the, the threat of another national, another disastrous national lockdown hanging over us, we all know that the borders are porous, are open, including the bizarre scenario of the border force going out to bring illegal immigrants into the country. And that's the scenario that we're in. It's been going on the entire length of time that we've had this coronavirus. And of course, it's been going on longer than that, but it's uh, just an extra little bit um, galling when we are being told to stay at home, all these restrictions placed on us, and the illegal immigration, particularly through the coast of Kent, continues the whole time. So I want to talk today about one of the companies involved in, well, one of the companies profiting from the illegal immigration coming into the UK as we speak, and that is Serco. Now, I've got a guest with me this evening. We'll call him Nick, and he has been researching Serco, and he sent me a document, and what I'm going to do with this video, I'm going to send you the documents that Nick has sent to me. There's a full detailed document, then a summarized report uh, that he wrote himself. I'll send both of them to you with a copy of this video. And I'll just give you a, a quick, before we do talk to, to Nick, let me just give you a quick a flick through some of the examples, some of the examples of things that he found out. Uh, these are, Serco was under investigation since 2013 by the Serious Fraud Office for swindling the government on contracts they had with them. The case was only suspended by a deferred prosecution agreement the same year as they signed up to a renewed asylum seeker accommodation contract. And that's the crux of the matter. The government has made a huge asylum seeker accommodation contract with Serco. Um, and as we know that the people are coming in illegally on the sh shores of Kent, we also know that the government is putting them up in hotels and Serco has its fingers in this pie. As of 2019, they are the largest provider of asylum seeker accommodation in the UK, with their main control areas being the Midlands, East of England and North West. The new asylum, asylum housing contract is the single largest contract they have been awarded in the company's history. Serco has a number of interesting people on its board. We'll get into those, but one of them includes Winston Churchill's grandson. In 2019, Serco pulled in a revenue of over three Billion. They claim to have made 120 million in trading profit. I will go into that in a little bit more detail uh, as well. And the last point given to me was the company is a hub for siphoning money. So we'll talk about all that in great detail now um, by talking to the person who wrote all of this, which is Nick. Good evening, Nick. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, is it good evening? Good, good, morning, uh, well, so. good morning when we're recording, my apologies. Uh, okay. Good evening yeah. when it goes out, which is tomorrow evening. All right, new to this, new to this. That makes okay. sense. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, thanks for having me. It's no bother to talk about this. Um, I'll just give a very quick background okay. as to how we went into this. So I'm um, just a member of a couple of, um, how should I say, uh, small political parties, um, uh, for Britain being one of them. And I was just asked on the sort of the off if I could um, have a look into originally the um, who the backers and the investors were of Circle because it, it's no surprise to anyone who's semi awake that we've got a what the government calls a sound seeker issue. It's actually illegal migrants coming in, mostly economic migrants. Um, and they're being housed in four star hotels. If you've ever browsed, for YouTube's filters and found to the live stream footage, you'll see them being taken in off Dover into coaches, and then you'll see them being housed in four-star hotels. Um, to give an example, the Novotel Hotel in the Newcastle area is rammed full of them. There's a lot of them in Liverpool uh, and the Coven, uh, sorry, um, uh, the Midlands area, etc. They're basically all over the place. And uh, I was asked if 
I could find anything sort of uh, embarrassing or enlightening on the backers behind Circle. Circle is, to my knowledge, and based on this report, which is what I investigated on this um, uh, 2019, uh, it's 2019 annual report that they made to Companies House. Companies House, for anyone who doesn't know, is the organization, the government organization that basically collates the financial and business data from any company that's registered in the UK. As I understand it, most of the information, if not all of it, should be publicly available. I doubt very much that they do put everything out. Um, but don't quote me on that. It's just my usual mistrust of government. But I went to Company's House and pulled up their annual report for 2019 as a start to try and find out something on this. And what I found was less about the investors and more about just the dealings of Circle itself. Circle from that company sales report is one of three very big companies that's been given over four billion pound, paid over not all in one lump sum, paid over a period of I think of ten years. It might vary between company to company, but Circle's piece of the pie is to be paid over ten years uh, to what they call house asylum seekers. It's called the AASC the Asylum Seekers Accommodation something, something. It'll be, it's named in the document, if I just find it out so there. Um, we'll find it in a bit, but it's uh, the abbreviation for is AASC, ah, Asylum Accommodation and Support Contract, that's it. And uh, really just looking through what they report, this 240 page document of mostly waffle, um, has within it some um enlightening aspects as to what's actually really going on not just in terms of their financial support but some backstory on how they got the contract how it is essentially uh, i'm paraphrasing in a layman's term but effectively saved their um, backsides um in 2019's annual turnover they would not as i understand it from reading the report have actually made any profit that year and to be perfectly honest they say they do extremely well. My um, first guess as a, a, a quantitative researcher of sorts, not a financial expert, but I do deal with numbers and stuff, is that they're really not doing well. And the thing you should point should take away from it is that you, the taxpayer, are paying for them to waste your money in the most exorbitant ways possible, which will give a nice example. And it's for stuff that really, in many people's view, should be not happening or even made illegal in some ways. All right, I would agree. Um, right, thanks thanks very much for doing that, first of all. So I've got this report in front of me. Should we go through it uh, from in yep. the way that you've written it? And, and perhaps you might want to pick out the bits you most want, because we'll send this around, as I say. But if there's anything you particularly want to get across or describe in more detail, um, please do. So if we start with sort of like in the initial bit, you need to ask yourself what Circle is. Um, a disclaimer, because you know how the, the loony lefties and anyone else who follows Com Purpose likes to catch you on any little thing. If I do miss say anything or whatever, just please go and read the company's house report and get it in its full context, but it is available. Um, but the general gist of it is as follows. So at the start of it, you've got what is Circle? Well, they effectively are a private company that performs public services. So many, many people in the country believe things and Circle quotes this themselves, that things like the NHS are public in the sense that they are run by the state. They are not. They are sold to private companies by the state. The state dictates the policies and the um, actions that they want the private companies to perform the services. So eff effectively, you've got this very horrible fusion of the worst aspects of state socialism with the worst aspects of privatization, capitalization, to give you a absolutely ridiculous mess of inefficiency that just doesn't work. Um, Circle describes itself as a leading provider of public services with expertise in five sectors or four geographies, defense, justice and immigration, transport, health and citizen services for the UK, Europe, North America, Asia, Pacific and Middle East. Um, the big crux is they have bases predominantly in the UK, America, Australia, and uh, the United Arab Emirates as the four ones that are mentioned most commonly throughout the report. UK, they are involved in um, sorting out the prison service systems. Um, I think they do do some stuff on healthcare. And the biggest thing I believe 
it, they de they declare their biggest in terms of revenue anyway is the asylum seek accommodation. Um, in Australia, as an example, they actually perform um, services. I would um, guess supplies, um, personnel, resources, whatever that the um, um, Australian police in the state of Victoria, anyone who's aware of Victoria knows about the hugely draconian measures that the Australia, uh, the Victorian state police are taking over there. Uh, some might be forgiven for thinking that they are effectively the, uh, the modern day Australian equivalent of the Gestapo right now. Um, Serco is involved in supplying and resourcing them. And in America, they have actually won a contract to supply and resource um, uh, United States um, Navy operations. So they've got their hands in a lot of pies, but effectively they're a private company performing public services. And as you might guess from that, most of the revenue, especially from the UK, it's taxpayer money. So you're paying for this. Um, you're paying for this inefficiency. So, I mean, to give an example of the UK revenue one, uh, mm. for 2019, they made over three billion in total revenue and over half of it was from the UK and Europe operations. Um, and then not too far in sort of like the seventh page, you start getting um, aspects of like, um, Circo was um, one of their subsi subsidiaries, Circo Geographics was caught up in an investigation by the UK Serious Fraud Office in 2013 and it ran for six years until they agreed on a deferred prosecution agreement in 2019. But that was the exact same year that they not only made substantial um, changes to their own um, board, but also won the largest chunk of the asylum accommodation and support um, contract award. So it was all very coincidental. It kind of, um, how should I say, um, crops interest at that point and it says here that the asylum contract is this the most recent asylum contract the one they've just gained is worth mm -hmm. 1.9 billion uh yes so as i mentioned there's 4.1 billion divided between three companies and circle got um virtually almost 50 percent of the chunk so they and that's paid over 10 years but it really was the contract win that saved their bacon. I mean, one tenth of that is 190 million. Um, it actually um, put them in the positive um, that year. Um, I don't, I, I mean, this is circumstantial in a way based on um, substantial evidence of like facts of when it happened and whatever. Um, but I would say it's not really a coincidence that the award of that contract and them pulling themselves out of. Um, uh, back into the black, as they say, back into the positive earnings. I don't think it was coincidental in that sense. They've been suffering for six years of really poor performance, pretty much because their reputation was destroyed by the serious fraud office um, investigation. So how much do we know about that investigation? What was what was found? What were um, they doing and what so was that? What they were doing in that one was they had contracts um, Justice contracts, it was, ah, here it is. Um, further elucidation on the investigation. Electronic monitoring. So there's limited information as to um, what that actually means, but it's to do with the UK justice system. I would guess it's to do with the prison service, so electronic monitoring of people released from prisoning. That would be a logical conclusion. Uh, don't quote me on that. But the electronic monitoring contracts that they had, effectively they were overcharging. Uh, so they're overcharging the taxpayer on them and they got caught out and it hurt their reputation. Investors started to pull out, shares plummeted and uh, revenues were declining. And it was not really the nicest thing to be caught out in. I mean, I suppose it doesn't really come surprise to people that a big company has been caught with their pants down in that respect. But it was just the fact that... Um, I mean, it took them six years of investigation and it was just the time in which the SFO dropped it. Um, they did, and they only dropped it to a deferred prosecution agreement, which means they can be prosecuted in the future once that DPA is up. Um, and they did have to pay the investigation charges, which I think amounted to a total of like 27, 29 million. Um, but it was... Um, it was a blow to them and one could be forgiven for speculating that maybe 
um, it is plausible to hypothesize that the reason for the DPA might have been if Serco scratches the government's back and agrees to some compromises and some uh, demands on housing the asylum seeker problem because it has ramped up at a pace bigger than before, we will defer the prosecution against you on this investigation. That could be completely wrong, but I don't think I think anyone reading these points and looking at the timing of these issues would be. I don't think it would be. You would be able to forgive someone for speculating as to whether that was the case. Of course, the company's house report will never admit anything like that, but the timings are incredibly ridiculous. There was only six months difference between when the SFO was dropped and the contract was awarded. Closer to the time of the, the DPA being dropped, they made changes to their um, their board. They actually let, uh, um, hired in some what I would describe as government unelected bureaucrats. One in particular sticks out. Um, very coincidental timing. So let's gather ourselves a little bit here. So we have this enormous company called Circo. They are involved in very, provision for normally, usually to the state on various different pies. We've gone through uh, defence, various parts of the justice system. And now obviously we have this new asylum seeker accommodation agreement, which is worth 1.9 billion between the UK government and this circle. Now, this contract comes six months after the serious fraud office dropped an investigation into Serco for overcharging the taxpayer in previous business arrangements. Yeah. Is, that, is that a fair enough summary? A fair enough summary. So we have a company with a, but they weren't found necessarily guilty, but they, nor were they declared to be innocent. So we've got a, a, a no result on that. So already, implied, implicated in defrauding the taxpayer is now involved in housing illegal immigrants across the UK at a taxpayer's cost of 1.9 billion at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how much do we know about Serco? Who, you said they changed their board around the same time. Who is on this board? Who are these people and how did they get, how big is this company? Who, who runs it? How, who are they? So the biggest sort of shuffle, the first one was about, say, maybe a year after that um, uh, fraud investigation was taken up and they rejuggled who was in the um, at the CEO level um, and the chairman. I will just have to bring that up. The one I can tell you, um, Rupert Sorms, he is the CEO of the company, um, has been for at least the for about the past five, six years, I would say. I'm just trying to pull up from the report just so I don't mislead anyone when that came about. But something that might um, uh, sort of, just while I'm looking for it, um, raise a few eyebrows. Rupert Sorms is indeed the grandson of Sir Winston Churchill. So it really comes as a bit of a slap in the face to people that one of the country's greatest heroes, the grandson of said hero, um, is the CEO of a company already in disrepute that is now the largest contributor to the housing of illegal migrants in the country, whilst also taking a whopping great big um, long-term incentive package. I'm slightly paraphrasing there, but um, the, a lot of CEOs have um, bonuses based on performance, annual performance, futures performance, etc. And uh, his is no exception to being absolutely outrageous. Um, we can get to uh, in perspective how much that um, amounted to, but uh, that's one. So they had a big reshuffle of the board, um, a new chairman. Ah, here it is. Sir Roy Gardner. I don't actually know much about that, but Sir Roy Gardner is the chairman. He was appointed in 2015, so a little bit after Rupert Sorms, the CEO who was appointed in 2014. So yes, I was correct there. Um, just one, about one year after the investigation started, they appointed Rupert Sorms as CEO and Angus Cockburn as the chief financial officer. So basically the chief financial officer and the CEO were swapped out a year after. One could say it was to try and turn the company around um, after the uh, debacle. And then a year after that in June, 2015, uh, July 2015, Sir Roy Gardner became the chairman of it. Um, 
the I'm gonna stick with um, Rupert Swans because he was one of the most interesting ones. But in his background, he's basically he's an Oxford University graduate in the exact same degree that about 70, 75 percent of our, and that is a pretty accurate number when you look at the pie chart of um, degrees and expertise and education for our um, uh, members of parliament. Uh, the philosophy, the politics, philosophy, and economics degree is hugely overrepresented in Parliament. Rupert Soames is no exception. He has graduated with that same degree, which they all seem to have. Former president of the Oxford Union. He has been a CEO of um, a banking and securities division at um, Agreco and uh, director of um, various audit companies. Um, and the uh, yeah, that's pretty much reading from the report. That's who he is, and him being the grandson of Sir Winston Churchill. And he has to, he has to be aware of what the hell it's actually going on when they say asylum seeker accommodation. There's no way he could not be aware of what's going on. Um, Angus Cockburn, similar sort of thing, MBA business school in Switzerland, honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh and a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of uh, Scotland. Um, again, auditor finance. So it should be his background is someone who should be um, very well versed in uh, economics. But when you see the reporting of their finances, you sort of think, mm, is he is he really, or are they just sort of like um, jazzing up their stuff, which I can get to an example there. Um, so that's there on that side. Um, and uh, the the last person of note, really is Rachel Lomax. She's the one that I would um, pseudo describe as a bit of an unelected government bureaucrat. She was appointed in 2014 sooner than um, Rupert Solms. Uh, it says here, significant experience in government economic policy. She's an MA in history from Cambridge University, MSc in economics from London School of Economics. Deputy Governor, Monetary Stability, Bank of England, member of the Monetary Policy Committee. She's worked in the Department for Transport, Department for Work and Pensions, and has a, had a senior post in the Welsh office, uh, and she's worked in the Welsh office and senior posts at the Cabinet Office, HM Treasury and World Bank. So she's basically, as I understand it, not an elected official, but she's one of these unelected ones who jumps from department to department. She's also a fellow of the largest and most reputable um, globalist think tank, um, Chatham House, which are the ones who um, established the Chatham House rules that now govern the likes of the infamous Bilderberg meetings every year for the elite, rich and famous there, which nobody knows what goes on. The Chatham House rule is that, in a nutshell, things do not have to be declared to the public. Um, they word it as you will not discuss these things with anyone not of relevance to the meeting or something in discussion, which eff effectively works out the same thing. She was appointed pretty much as the SFO investigation had just got on the ground. And and if you look at the, um, the some of the terms of the DPA on the SFO, if I recall correctly, one of the things that I found interesting is that they have to report to the Home Office um, as a term of service on the um, uh, thing. Now, I thought that was very strange because I would have thought that the series, um, as a terms of the DPA, Circle would have to report to the, um, the Crown Prosecution Service and the Series Fraud Office because they were the ones Serious fraud initiated the investigation and the Crown Prosecution Service takes account of the actual um, judicial aspect of seeing that through. I don't understand, and it's not made clear, why Circle would have to report directly to the Home Office on an issue. It's supposed to, as I understand it, go through the CPS. I could be completely wrong about that, but it didn't strike me as the usual way to do it. Um, oh, the other one that they may have had to report themselves into is the UK Financial Conduct Authority, which should be overseeing such misdemeanors um, and sorting them out. But why it has to be the Cabinet Office, I do not know, because the Cabinet Office is supposed to be the aid to the Prime Minister. Why would the Cabinet Office need to be involved in it? Doesn't doesn't make sense. Uh, it's all rather interesting. I mean, these people are all heavily hmm. connected to the state. 
Aren't they? Well, I misspoke there. I said initially the Home Office. You could you could be forgiven for them being the Home Office. office. But it, yeah, it is the Cabinet Office. Uh, I was trying to look for it. It is in the company's house report. It's the Cabinet Office that got report to. And it's really, really interesting that Rachel Lomax has actually worked in Cabinet Office and several other government ones. It's almost as if she is the the representative to oversee that they do as they're told. Again, speculation, but again, when you when you get enough sort of um, coincidences, they can start to paint up a pretty pretty picture. Yes, yeah, and and we're not. We've got, it's, we've got every reason to distrust the government. Let's face it, and and those involved and big business. No, but we could, on the next, we could spend yeah. half a day listing the amount of things the government has lied to us on and been proven to lie to. Us on. So wouldn't be, so wouldn't have a list. Um, right. Next part on the, reading through your your document, asylum accommodation and support service contract. Mm -hmm. So this will tell us what kind of this new 1.9 billion contract this this company have just take undertaken at, at, with taxpayers' money. Tell us about what that means, please. As I understand it from the report, they are responsible from everything. So basically, as soon as the um, asylum seeker or economic migrant or illegal migrant, however which way you want to define them, enters the country, they are responsible for literally everything from the transportation to temporary accommodation, the um, food they are given, any extra additional money that they're given, clothing, the whole shebang. When you actually read the details in the House report as to what they are responsible for, I mean, they could, they'll probably try to defend themselves. They only get, say, like um, food vouchers, etc., and blah, blah, blah. But when you, if you actually did a proper assessment of what they are given, they will probably end up wealthier than a person on universal credit and basic thing uh, pensions. Even if it doesn't come in the form of cold hard cash, which they do actually get a cash amount, um, they are literally spoon fed while they're here. And we've all seen from the videos the hotel accommodation, which is their temporary accommodation. They are going to be housed elsewhere, uh, as you might expect, which then one wonders about the um, housing estates that are being developed in some of the new ones. Um, I do know from talking to people that the waiting list for council houses has become ridiculously long and that people from a migrant background, or at the very least, it has been discussed. This is sort of like, um, um, you know, talking with general Joe public that BAME or anyone from a sort of um, minority or, um, uh, high up on the common purpose of background will be prioritized that should come as no surprise because you just need to look at things like the bbc in terms of how they um send out their job adverts there are literally job advert adverts out there where no um white british person may apply for it you have to come from the BAME position that is happening in our housing as well a lot of council housing now comes out under um, private companies um it's no longer directly run by the council it might be monitored and supervised by them but the uh, there are actual private companies that provide the housing the repair jobs etc and the thing is circle has a lot it's a it's a super company that owns a lot of subsidiaries for example in terms of transport they are a major stakeholder shareholder in i believe northern rail so you have to then wonder what else they they have i would bet good money that they have either hired out or own private companies for housing estates and they are looking where they can house them in there the hotels are literally just the um, the stop gap but they will hire everything out from the coaches um the food etc that's where your 1.9 billion per year uh, sorry 1.9 billion over 10 years is going to what what do you think? Tell me your summary of all this. What do you think is going on? Is this just good old fashioned corruption? What can we do about it? Well, in terms of what we can do about it, uh, we will never be able to do anything about it unless we start um, uh, mobilizing the public sort of interest in voicing their disgust at it i will this is outside the jurisdiction of circle i don't know which of the other two companies is um in charge of wales 
um, Circle before the AS, AASC contract, because this isn't a new thing. They've been doing this for a while. There was a, a an immigration contract. It went under a different name um, prior to um, 2019. It, the, AS, the AASC was the renewed contract version of it. Um, before that, Circle did not own the Midlands. Circle owns uh, or has jurisdiction over the Midlands and the Northwest and possibly the Northeast, but don't quote me on that. So they basically they have the bulk of England and they describe it as their, the, the redistribution of the, the, the regions that fall under their jurisdiction for sorting this out makes them the single largest provider of asylum seeker accommodation, as they put it, in the entire UK. Um, previously, they used to um, oversee operations in Scotland and Northern Ireland. That would be prior to 2019. So many people have seen the army barracks being used in that um, little place in Wales, and the locals are not happy. There was a um, live recording of an old man who was supposed to be on one day pick up his uh, granddaughter, I believe, from school. He couldn't because he was assaulted. Um, assaulted by one of the security guards on site of the army barracks because he went there filming and protesting. He hadn't attacked anyone. But as I understand it from the recording, the um, security guard in question took off his body camera and assaulted the old man and went back inside. Well, of course, that sent more of the locals livid and they went there, you know, really storming. Um, and I do believe there may be repercussions or at least there is enough video data there. Now, you have to ask yourself, who employs that security guard? It will be, when you trace it all the way back, a company like Circle. It will, I don't believe it's Circle in this instance because I don't believe they have the jurisdiction of Wales, but there are two other companies involved in it. Um, that information has been conveyed to For Britain. I just can't remember what the names of the other two companies are at the minute. But there will be similar instances of things like this, definitely in the Midlands and stuff. What else is, I mean, what you've, you've, you've obviously immersed yourself in all this. It's a lot to take in. Um, and it does just scream good old fashioned corruption. Uh, and oh. a, a sign that the, the to, to quote a, a certain um, president, <laughs> drain the swamp. Tell me I what else you found. What's your overall view? Tell me what else you found out. Anything we've missed, anything. Um, you think people would be interested in hearing? Just tell me what you what you think of Circo generally. Well, speaking as someone with um, a, a sort of like a, a science quantitative research background, so I am good with numbers, but I'm no financial expert. I would look at um, definitions of, say, for example, underlying trade profit as one that's heavily sort of thrown in your face on the Circo's company house report because it makes them look good with 120 million. Um, so I looked up the definitions of what each of these things mean as I'm understanding the numbers. And as I keep on going through it, it doesn't get any better. 120 million out of a 3 billion revenue, that's, you know, it's it's less than um, it's less than 10 percent uh, of the thing. But you could possibly be excused. I mean, they do have big expenses, but then it gets worse because what you have to remember to a lesser extent in science, but a huge extent in finance, as far as I can see. They like to make up terminology. So the average um, normal common sense person, when they think of, say, annual profit, would think that uh, that year's total income minus the total expenses for that year. In finance, it doesn't work that way. They have a terminology for a different form of profit for every occasion. So they always throw in, they throw in your face underlying trade profit, 120 million. But when you go down, you realize that that number doesn't take into account all of the liabilities. Here's the point. Um, when you start taking into more forms of taxation, that 120 million actually drops to 50.6 million. Um, and then actually, you, you think, you think, because I think they define it as annual profit, you think that's the end of it. It's not, because included in the company's house report is an independent auditor who goes through and comes to the same numbers, but then they go even further. There are even more taxes that they've missed out in the reporting to give these fancy looking numbers. And I'm just trying to find it. It's um, somewhere, but it's total comprehensive income 
if I do believe. Um, just bear with me while I find it. Um, oh, come on. Ah, here it is. So the independent auditor was KPMG. When you take into account, as KPMG shows, and as far as I can tell, all of the um, taxations on their profit and their uh, incomes, etc., their annual liabilities and etc., and their exceptional items, you end up dropping that 50.6 million to only 4.1 million. Now, please, they started with a revenue of 3 billion. Their total comprehensive income for the year, which accounts for virtually all of the expenses of 4.1 million. Now, to put that in perspective, I mentioned that Rupert Solms gets nice long-term incentive bonuses just for being a member of the, um, the board, the CEO, and they do have a sort of a percentage scale based on the company's so-called performance, which they can skew whichever which way they like. Rupert Solms earned more. He earned more than the actual total comprehensive income in total revenue. I'm just trying to find exactly where on my notes he did. But I do remember off the top of my head, Rupert Solms' uh, base income was £850,000. Now, please tell me. Who cannot survive by £850,000? Then he had something like uh, £200,000 for his pension. So he comes up to a million on um, here. Ah, here it is. Here's it. Um, he came up to a million, over a million in terms of his actual base salary, pension, etc. And then the long-term incentives. Um, which even if they are for a while invested in shares and stocks, it gave him a total income of, I believe, 4.5 million, right? Which is 451,000 more than Circle's actual audited comprehensive income. In other words, he took away in terms of total net um, more than the actual true profit of the company. and you have to then account for the chief financial officer, Angus Cockburn, who didn't take with 4.5. I think he got something along the lines of 3 million in total. That's close to seven. That's seven to 8 million that these two took away themselves. How can you actually sleep at night knowing that your salary was actually larger or on par with the actual comprehensive income, the real profit of your company for the year? It's insane. And when you take that 4.1 million that I mentioned, the 1.9 billion AASC contract is paid over 10 years. One year, just a, a blanket sort of average and then divide by 10, is 190 million. If they hadn't won that contract, they wouldn't have even got that 4.1 million in comprehensive income, as I understand it. It's insane. They would have been really in the negative. Really, really enriching themselves with all this, aren't they? This is basically taxpayers' money almost laundered before being handed to these people. We're getting a terrible service for it. Um, we can't trust them. And yet being awarded these massive contracts and enriching themselves very, very nicely indeed. Corruption. Oh, absolutely. Um, I would call it legalised corruption. Mm. That's exactly what I would call it. And uh, the reason stuff like this should be pursued, it has to be, I mean, what you do with this information, I mean, I drew this out from 240 pages of waffle. Mm -hmm. You need to put this in a context that people can understand that they are stealing your money mm -hmm. and then throwing it into people who will effectively replace you, if not in jobs, in housing, etc. They're being prioritized while your own people are being condemned to live on the streets or worse. And uh, these people are basically using this company more as a, um, they could be using it as tax haven. I can't um, confirm or deny that, that's just pure speculation, but they are definitely getting their fair share of revenue out of it. Well, it's not actually putting any real money back into the economy. I mean, public services by default are usually, uh, they don't create revenue. I talked to someone about this before who was really happy about, 
reports saying that in years to come, the second most demand uh, in demand job in the country would be care worker. And I turned to him and said, care worker, really? State subsidized care work? And he went, yeah. And I was like, you better hope that's not true. And he went, why? I was like, because unlike mining or farming or say um, entrepreneur inventing stuff or motor cars or something, anything that's got substance to a real substance, that doesn't generate wealth. It doesn't put back in. It generates wealth for the company who is performing the service, but that's it. It's not the highest impact in terms of boosting a country's economy. Anyone can figure that out, especially when it's state subsidized, it's taxpayer subsidized. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is exactly what Circle is. This horrible fusion of state welfare turned to mad socialism fused with the worst aspects of capitalism. In, it, it really does sort of like lead way to maybe we should just go privatized and competitive sort of thing. I mean, you take the NHS, for example, that is the it sort of gets like six billion in funding every year or on that order. But it's worse than private areas like America and America you're seeing to in minutes. You get what you pay for. But in Britain, there are cancer treatments, standard cancer treatments being taken off the list that you could only get through truly private hospitals when most of your NHS is private anyway. You'd have to either go to the most expensive private off the NHS hospital in the country or to America to get some standard treatments. It's insane. We've actually managed to do, I think, one better than standard socialism and communism in some ways. Because in communism, you don't have a private company. The, the government just owns it. We've actually managed to do one worse. No, it, just, it's such a brilliant description that you've you've given there, the, the worst of socialism with the worst of capitalism. And actually, listening to you go through it there, that's pretty much what it is. Um, I think I'm going to have to do a Sunday column on this this week to expand on that point a little bit because it's a brilliant one. Um, thank you very much for all that, Nick. I really, really, really do appreciate that. Any final points? Um, well, the two things are, it depends really on what for Britain or any group that's passionate on these issues wants to do, is to convey such information in a way that can mobilise people to actually, even if it's just get moving and go out and vote people out who are then pumping money into these companies, or if you know of something that, say, Circle's working on, voice your displeasure at them, write to them and whatever, put it in such a way, because I hate to be harsh with this, but Aspects like the mass industrial gang rape of our kids moved some people, but not a lot of people. And we can take any sort of example you like, but money does seem to move people when they actually realize it's smacked in their face. Well, you don't get much worse. OK, I would say the NHS, if you investigate, probably worse, but circles pretty high on the list. So that's one point. The second point is, is that I did this just as a sort of a first glance um, investigation into it. I would love to see one. And I always quote him because he's and cite him because he's such a character and he really seems to talk sense and know his stuff. You need someone like Godfrey Bloom or someone as skilled as him to pick up on this and come with the proper financial auditing sort of banking background. And really plug it in. I could do it myself, but it'll take three times as long. So because this is the tip of the iceberg, the company's house only reports so much. Most of that like was 85% waffle, less than 15% useful stuff. But there are tools out there to get you access to um, other things like the big shareholders of things like, J uh, don't quote me on this, but things like JP Morgan, HSBC, all the big sort of um, mega banks, mega companies in circle. But it would be interesting to pursue this further and just see how bad it goes. And the final aspect would be to try and inquire. I don't know if you could do. It might be a bit. You'd probably be able to get a free and infant request, information request to the government to ask them what the ASC in turns in terms of what the companies provide. I think because Circle's private, they would not fall under that jurisdiction. But you could query the government. What does it mean? What exactly are you asking these companies to provide? Because I've speculated on some, told the truth on others, because we can see it in our faces, but that kind of thing. So, yeah. Good idea, actually. We'll try it. 
we'll try it. I mean, I've been doing a lot of freedom of information quests these days, so why not? Why not one more and see what we come back with? Um, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, we'll let, we'll see if Godfrey will come on, um, and if and when he does, we'll get you back on if you if you're interested in that. Uh, it, it would be interesting yeah. because the the um. From my perspective, Circle was up to its neck in debt, mm -hmm. really huge debt. It took something like a 200 million um, uh, multi-bank loan. Uh, I forget the exact terminology of it, but you put this kind of stuff in front of someone like him, and he'd be able to tell you just how bad bad is. It wouldn't really come any surprise to people, but maybe there's a way to convey this information. Yeah and mobilize it into a, a political or even just some sort of patriotic me message that gets people moving because really it is a bit of a sad state and it's not just britain but a lot of the western world we've become more focused about our creature comforts and what's in our pocket rather than the real sort of morally principled issues but if this is what gets people moving i don't care yeah i i'm i'm, I'm, I'm pretty much the same i mean it, money will get people moving and we do have, I mean, just to, you know, to, to, again, to summarise all of this, we do have a running level of corruption here. Uh, and to summarise it, we've got people running a company or heading a company, one of whom is, is steeped in, in government jobs in her past, um, well-connected, wealthy people, getting huge amounts of taxpayers' money, and like you said, Nick, to use it to, well, some people would say replace us, uh, to use it to put strangers up in nice hotels while British troops, British veterans, and other British people are sleeping on the streets. It is too much to take. It really, really is. And the timing of all of this, like you pointed out, uh, six months between the dropping of a case or an investigation against them and then being awarded this contract, which saved their skin. Um, cronyism, corruption, we need to drain the swamp, essentially. Like, the system's not the problem. The problem is that currently the people sitting in the system and they're the ones who have to be removed and replaced with honesty uh, and decency, at least for as long as we can manage it until yeah. we become animal farm like corrupt again. But we do. This is this is good old fashioned corruption. The people need taking out only the, these people need taking out. And the only way we can do it, and I mean taking out of power, the only way we can do it is, as you know, I believe very strongly is to um, is to go after them at the ballot box. Yeah, well, actually, um, Circor couldn't even get the um, AS, AASC correct according to whatever the government um, requires. And this is, you know, occasionally a newspaper like The Guardian does come through for me. They're usually a lost cause, but they do like bashing yeah, something. Yeah. Um, there is a point where The Guardian um, made a report. Uh, they wrote an article dated um, the 18th of September 2020 where Circle was fined, um, oh, I've lost it, fined a million for failing to perform to requirements regarding their asylum seekers contract. I don't believe it elaborates on what those requirements were. I failed to see how you could be fined when you see the live stream videos of what these people are actually being housed in. How did you manage to fail with respect to the government's demands and get fined an extra million? Which is 25% of 2019's actual profit. All right. You really don't. It's really doing well. It all stinks to high heaven. It really does. Um, thank you ever so much, Nick. That was really, really interesting. Um, and we'll we'll well, continue this. I'll see if Godfrey will. We'll see if we can get Godfrey on, um, and we'll continue it in a bit more detail. Thanks ever so much for doing all that research as well and for coming on uh, this evening. Thanks for watching. Another frightening. Another frightening glimpse of the powerful and who is in power are uh, the, the connected i've said before that they all drink in the same wine bars this is just another example of that all connected using your money to enrich themselves and bringing people here at your expense people who will we have we will have countless problems we know the problems that we have cultural problems religious problems we know the kind of problems that are being stored up with this huge level of immigration illegal and otherwise and it's being facilitated by corrupt 
I, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, they let them sue <laughs> corrupt, corrupt companies like Serco using your money. This we've got, we've got to get moving. As Nick says, we've got to move. We've got to hit back. We've got to fight back. That's by taking their power away. That's the only thing they're scared of is if we take their power and reclaim it for ourselves. We can and we must. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me this evening. I shall see you back on my live stream on Monday at half past seven. Take care of yourselves until then.